Since times before history, we've been gathering around our fires to tell stories. Join us as we play through multiple role-playing game systems, looking for one that's the perfect fit for our next campaign, and hopefully showing you some options that are out there for your own games. Welcome to the Fireside Stories. Hello, Barbarians, and welcome to our Numenera Fireside Story. As always, I am Rainy, and I will be running this game. I'm Santiago, and I'll be playing the game. Woo! All right, for those of you that are listening to these episodes while they're new, um, it's important for us to talk a little bit about our Blackwind Fireside Story, which, as you know, the first three episodes already came out and we're just waiting on episode four, which I believe is our finale. That'll be the finale. And yeah, we had a bit of a snag with that. So so our Blackwind finale was our first time having a remote player so we could have another person in the group. But we had never done that type of recording before. And when we went back to editing, um, it just wasn't the quality that we wanted because um, we really want something that's as easy and fun to listen to as the game was to play. And we just didn't feel like it did it justice. Yeah, we didn't want to do that to you. So we um, couldn't re-record right away because our guest actually was out of town for a while. Um, Then we did some research, kind of looked into different options for recording. And we're hoping to have that fourth episode out to you guys shortly. But so we didn't have too much of a gap in the meantime. We decided to jump into our next fireside story and just release that next episode for Blackwind as soon as it's ready. Yes. I've been kind of itching to get in a new Monera as well. So that's a double-edged blade. So for those of you unfamiliar, new Monera is a Monty Cook system. It uses sort of the cipher system underlying rule set. And the world of new Monera, also known as the Ninth World, is a place that is very far from our current timeline. And it's so far in the future for us that the world is pretty unrecognizable to what we would understand of it. The idea is that there have been multiple civilizations that have risen to prominence and fallen or risen to prominence and left planet or various other things. And the current civilization that exists on the world is They're aware that civilizations have come before, but they don't know much of their history. However, the evidence of those civilizations kind of litters the world in ruins, in technologies left behind, in mutated creatures or even alien creatures brought from different places. And in technology so fantastic that it's indistinguishable from magic. Right. Which was something that was really cool when I was reading the book and I was super impressed with, um, Monty cook. Yes. Yeah. Who, who wrote this? I was, I, I was just tickled pink <laughs> reading this. Like, this guy really crushed it. Writing this backstory, this world, everything else. And starting off with that Arthur C. Clarke quote was great. So yeah, if you want to hear more about that, our reactions to the setting and to character creation, Definitely um, make sure you're a patron because that gives you access to our character creation sessions before the start of every story. Um, And otherwise, if you're a patron, you'll also get behind the scenes podcasts for every episode where we talk a little bit about what we thought of things. But otherwise, uh, we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Um, I am going to give a little bit of background about where we are, but otherwise, because the ninth world is so different than other systems that we play in, I am going to use a lot of the terminology as if it is known and common, and we will explain it as we go if needed. Um, And I'll leave a lot of that to you, I think, for bringing up if it's something you want more details on. Yeah, I'll be a good soundboard for that because half the time, I won't know what the hell you're talking about. So, you know, you explaining it to me will serve dual purpose. So our story takes place in part of this pathway in the ninth world called the Wandering Walk. And it is functionally, it's sort of like a pilgrimage route. 
it's a path that is not an easy path. So it's not used for trade and things like that. It's pretty taxing and it touches every part of the known world. And so people who are looking to test themselves, who are looking, you know, for internal peace, who are really getting from one place to another in a way that is not easy, a little kind of road less traveled, um, can take the walk to do that. And people on the walk are often referred to as peregrines, or in a more derogatory way, they'll be referred to as birds. Which is kind of sad, really, because birds can be pretty cool. So I am going to go ahead and get into the introduction. If during this or at any point in the game, if you either want your character to interrupt to do something, or you as a player want to understand more of what I'm talking about, just let me know. Okay. Okay? You have stopped at one of the mouth cairns, tucked in the shadow of a hulking metallic structure along the wander. These shallow circular hollows, each marked by a short round wall built from the jaws of dead peregrines, are considered among the few safe places along this stretch of the route. Those who enter a bone circle must give some promise of their good intentions to the slain, lest the dead mouths awake and cast their retribution. Even those who don't believe in the so-called slay tongue may find themselves at the end of a weapon if they try to break the peace here. Still, you've heard the rumor that something's attacking even those sequestered in the cairns, travel through the areas more dangerous than usual, and others camping in and around the mouth cairns have heard similar stories. So this kind of sets the stage and provides you with a feel for the setting that your character is in. Do you have any questions before we introduce your character? So this is a cave. Basically, it's a kind of a windbreak made out of bones. Okay. That has been built against a an ancient metallic structure. Ah, I see. So from one of the previous civilizations. Mm, okay. And these sorts of cairns, these mouth cairns, dot this part of the wander. Are and they, they're considered kind of a sanctuary place to camp. Are they always built against uh, artifact metal or are they built up against normal rock or yeah, trees? Yeah, they can and be built stuff? against various things. The idea is just to create a, a semi shelter. Um, but this one happens to be built against uh, some sort of construct. And they're usually built from the jawbones of wanderers who have perished. Yes. Okay. That is pretty cool. Uh, no, I mean, I don't really have a whole lot of questions other than you have to make some uh, peace offering, basically, like a pledge to keep the peace. Right. And if you don't, then everyone breaks their pledge to keep the peace and kicks you out, <laughs> like, basically. Yeah, it's the idea that you're not supposed to do violence here, especially to other travelers. Mm. And there's... Kind of a couple of reasons for that. One, the other travelers who are probably already there take it pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, they'll kick you out. But two, if you're a little superstitious, you probably believe in something called the slay tongue. Mm -hmm. And the slay tongue is sort of the angry voice of the dead. So if you desecrate the memories or bodies of the deceased, this is the thing that comes for you. Okay. Hmm. I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. <laughs> so it's probably better to hedge my bets and, and follow the rules. Plus, you know, he's trying to lay low, so there's really um, no need to rock the boat. All right. So as we kind of zoom in to this little area that you're camped in with other people, you're not here alone this night. There are other travelers who are tucked into this cairn. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who your character is? Okay. In Numenera, you have this really cool device to describe your character in a sentence that they set up for you. And what you're supposed to do, and you don't have to do this in any particular order really, but you come up with a name, a descriptor, and decide on a type and a focus. And the descriptor, type, and focus are things that uh, are part of the game mechanics. And then, of course, the name is just what you name your 
your dude. So the sentence that I ended up with after creating my character is Kane Ristak is a clever glaive who fuses flesh and steel. And he's not very remarkable looking. He's he's fairly plain in most respects in that he doesn't have anything uh, gaudy or flashy about him. He has beautiful light brown skin and spiky black hair with golden eyes, which are probably the most uh, striking thing about him in a mundane sense. Um, and he's not super tall. He's not remarkably short. He's just kind of your um, average yeah, build and so on in every sense. And for now, um, he is on the wander for his own reasons. Okay. So this particular Cairn camp um, is pretty peaceful. There's about a dozen other travelers sharing the sleeping and cooking space that it provides. In this area that you're in, and we talked a bit about this in the character creation session, um, there are certain happenings that occur in this region called light swarms. There is not one this night. Um, and there are stars, though. You're out in the in the wilderness. There are glow globes that people have brought with them. And there's a little drink to share. Uh, the weather in the lee of the structure is dry and passable. And in the early evening, there's some disgruntled talk around the fire. So a few of the things that you're hearing is, uh, used to be light swarms here near every night. Haven't seen one in a long time. And then another person says, I heard the iron wind came through here not long ago. But then the conversation turns towards a recent rash of deaths in the mouth cairns, and the group starts to grow restless as they discuss them. It's just rumors, insists one old man. Both palms and the exposed length of his arms are covered in elaborate blood scars. No, my mother saw it with her own eyes, dead in one of the cairns. A younger man. He points at a woman sleeping along the edge of the hollow and then makes the circle of augmentation with his hands. She has mech eyes. Trust me, she sees everything. And there's nervous laughter from the group. Most everyone here has a mother, after all, and they all remember her impossible eyesight, augmented or not. Do you want to do anything? Or is there anything you want me to explain? What are blood scars? So blood scars are a mark of those who have been on the wander a long time. So it's common for a pilgrim to start by creating a circular scar on their palm. And the longer they journey, the larger and more intricate the scar becomes. And it's sort of a tribute or remembrance, sort of like a tattoo of sorts of what they've survived along the way. Okay. And the one kid mentioned that his mom is asleep nearby. Yes. Okay. Is she visible or is she just like a hump of blankets? You can see parts of her. I mean, she's in sort of, you know, a little bundle of blankets, but she's not completely covered. Okay. I just want to mark her mentally mm -hmm. because if she has um, augmented eyes, that could be, that could go poorly for me if she can see, you know, um, below the surface right depending on how they change her vision right. right and then but by the same token if she's augmented herself it might not be such of a much for me but it's still something that I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for because again trying to lay low here now there we have to entering the cairn space we have to make some kind of pledge did i already do that or whatever. Well, it's How, not something you necessarily even have to do out loud. It's almost the idea, like, when you come in, you're doing even just a silent prayer of, like, you know, I promise to keep the space sort of thing. But if you wanted to do something or say what you decided to do, that's fine. It's the uh, the unwritten book of the road. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that I would do anything overtly. It, it's just a matter of understanding the unspoken rules of the place. And I do having been on the trail for a while. Right. So, um, if I can just, uh, stride up and join the fire, that would be for the best. Just 
to blend in maybe if there's a main fire or something like that. Yeah, there's definitely a main fire where this group is talking and where the talk has turned to the rumors of the dead in the cairns. Okay, cool. So you said there are people sharing the uh, cooking and sleeping facilities and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, handing out, I don't know, stew or what have you. Yeah, I would say that a few of them have pulled together some of their rations to make a meal. It's probably stew-like since that's easy to prepare on the road. Um, A couple others are passing, passing around Um, cans and bottles of various beverages Um, and you know and a few various things like that it seems like inside a cairn it's a very community atmosphere Mm -hmm. particularly because the cairns are really only used by people on the walk so you know that everyone here is also a peregrine also a traveler right so when Kane walks up to the fire and steps over the you know log or whatever to have a seat he'll look around the circle of firelit faces and uh anyone who meets his eyes he'll he'll nod at them in a congenial fashion as he digs through his pack looking for some of his uh his rations so he does have an explorer's pack that i think contains some uh some food ration type sure food food stuffs Right. And if it becomes clear that what you're looking for in your bag is something to eat, um, the the one who is talking at the fire who has the intricate blood scar up both arms would turn to you and say, no worries here, son. While there's enough of us in one cairn, we have plenty to share. And he gestures towards the stew at the cook fire. Okay. And looking around after he says that, does it seem as though... Everyone else here has already served themselves. They have empty bowls or similar next to them or anything like that. Yeah, it's dark enough that the assumption at this point is probably most people who are going to stop in the cairn are already here. And so people are either actively eating or have eaten and have kind of gone off to their sleeping areas. Okay, gotcha. Okay, well, if there's any uh, cleaning up I can help with, I'll, uh, he'll stand up and he'll give... The uh, it'll give the the traveler that invited him to eat a sort of thank you gesture from his culture, where you touch uh, the four fingers of one hand to your your chest, chin, and forehead, and sort of hand it off to him, and uh, with a slight bow of the head, and gather up any dirty dishes that might be around, take to take them over to that area and get something to eat. And then listen. Okay. So the talk continues late into the night, starting with, you know, what they were talking about, the dead bodies being found in the cairns, despite historically them being a safe place. Um, And then that turns to wounds um, that people have sustained on their journeys. And then that turns into odd wounds that aren't explainable. And everyone... By the time it gets to the point that you're supposed to be sleeping, leaves a little chilled by the the subject matter, despite the soft air. Um, And so many in the circle find themselves awake long after their usual hours. But still in the end, everyone must sleep. And there are more than a few who, waking in the morning, are surprised to find they are whole and unharmed. They're is something delicious about opening your eyes to a lifting light and realizing that it's neither the glow of the afterlife nor the shine of a falling blade of a knife. The realization gives the morning's activity a boisterous and comradely feel. So everyone's kind of moving around to break up camp in the morning to continue on their way, whichever direction they're going. And there is a sound in the distance, something like hooves. And it's far away. So at first, it sounds a bit like a group, not maybe not a whole army, but definitely a group, a number of creatures making their way in this direction towards the hollow that you're in. But no one can see anything along those lines and along the horizon. Not even the mother with the augmented eyes. Oh, she's awake now. 
Yeah, it's morning. Okay. So people are breaking up camp. She's awake. She's up and about. Yeah. I'd like to examine her uh, eyes to see if I can determine how augmented they are or if it's just uh, eyes in the back of her head hyperbole from the sun. Okay. Um, you have some experience with that sort of biotech. So I'm going to say that this is normally a difficulty for intelligence task. Is there anything you'd like to do to adjust that or is that, is that okay with you? You know, I don't think so. Looking at all of my skills, I don't necessarily have anything that would fit with any of that. So, uh, no, that's okay. I'll just take a look. Okay. See what I can find out. All right, so that means you need to roll 12 or better. Okay. All right, I rolled a three. <laughs> Especially without being, like, horribly obvious, it's really hard to get a good look at what type of augmentation her eyes have. But you do see, especially as the sound continues, she continues to scan the horizon, which makes you think that it's probably, like, acuity and distance that are her primary foci for her her augmentation. Okay. More eagle-eyed as opposed to scannery type of Right. As far as you can tell, it could be more than that, but right. you really you don't know at this point. Could be, but that's what she seems to be doing right now. Yes. So, all right. Um, and eventually, as she keeps looking up to sort of scan the horizon, she calls out. She's like, I know it doesn't match what we're hearing, but I'm seeing only one creature. And uh, it looks like a, a scutamorph coming across the sands from the direction of the wood. And it's at a superb pace. Looks like it's got two riders. And there is a murmur from the group at this news. Um, scutamorphs aren't incredibly rare. People know what they are. So I'm going to go ahead and let you see what they look like. I'm going to go ahead and put that in dungeon text so you can take a look. So scutamorphs look like huge brown centipedes or millipedes to our senses. And they're known to spend most of their lives coiled around like trees or other upright tube-like structures. Um, they're not something known to be used as mounts or domesticated in any way. And so when the mother says this, there is a murmur from the group because no one actually rides these things. That sounds bananas. Okay. And the young man turns to her. He says, you sure what you're seeing, mother? And the others shush him and start to strain their eyes northward to see what they can see. Does anybody break out any technology to help with that? No, you don't note anyone grabbing anything Numenera-wise, okay. artifact-wise. Or just even, like, uh, binoculars or <laughs> a telescope, looking glass. Those things would be technology things. A, a rifle with um, a <laughs> scope on it. That, that would all be technology. See, guns are incredibly rare, actually. Okay. But yeah, so no, besides the, everyone seems to be relying on the mother's augmented eyes. She seems to be the best technology for seeing whatever is coming this way. Okay. And you see, no one is actually going for weapons very much either. Everyone seems pretty comfortable with the idea that this is a cairn. And so it should be fine. Okay. I'm a little nervous based on last night's conversations. Sure. Uh, this is a cairn and all of that, but it's a pretty, you know, flimsy shield against anyone who just blatantly wishes to uh, disregard that. So I'm going to be uh, alert. Sure. Um, did you want to make a check to see if you know what the false woods is since you talked about it coming from the wood? Yes, okay. because I think I do know what the false woods is. I mean, I know that they're to the north. Yes. And I might know more. All right, so, let so me this is intellect uh, difficulty two. Okay. So you need six or better. Gotcha. Here we go. 16. All right. So you may have actually passed by the false woods, depending on the direction you were coming from. 
But otherwise, even if you haven't seen it yourself, travelers along the road have talked about it. And so you're generally familiar with what the False Woods is. It's a place that looks like a forest of trees. But if you actually get into it and look at it, you can see that it's actually made of synth tubes that are topped by some sort of living mesh, um, some sort of construct that did something at one time. And scudomorphs are known to inhabit the area. So it does make sense that whoever these visitors are, are from the false woods. And Essentially, yeah, especially if the woman's right and this is a scudomorph with riders. I don't see any reason to distrust her. I don't think she would randomly make that up. Right. All right. I so, mean, I don't know her at all, but it just seems like a really strange thing to do. So. Yeah. And so, pretty much at this point, because you can see a shape in the distance, everyone has stopped what they're doing and has started sort of standing at the wall of the cairn to get a glimpse at whatever is coming. You do notice, although everyone seems comfortable with the idea that the cairn should be safe, all of them have decided to wait inside the wall for whatever this thing is. Yeah, I think this would provide, um, I don't know, some measure of cover, at least concealment. So everyone's sort of looking to the north. Because there is a shape that you can start to make out in the distance um, from the direction where that sound of many footfalls or hoofbeats or whatever it is is coming from. And much like the mother said, it seems to be one thing. And as it gets closer, you can see the creature and its riders. It's arriving quickly. It's many flat feet, barely disturbing the earth as it settles to a stop a bit away from the structure. One of the riders is a young man. He's clearly injured from a fight of some kind. His wounds are serious, but probably not life-threatening yet. The other rider is barely older than a child. It's a clearly distraught girl. All right, I want to see what you notice about them. So let's go ahead and roll an intelligence check. This is difficulty three, so it's nine or better. Okay, here we go. Eighteen. Okay, so 18 is the first special roll. Um, in this case, since it's not combat, it wouldn't do anything, but just, you know, if this were a combat, you would do some extra damage okay. with that sort of roll. Good roll, good roll. All right. All right. So you are watching them very carefully as they approach and kind of move to a stop. And even though it seems like the, the boy is the one sort of leading whatever their intent is, it looks like the girl, even in whatever anguish she is in, is the one who is somehow the tamer of this scudomorph. It seems to be responding to her touch and her commands. And so this creature with these two functionally children on its back um, stops a, a distance away from the wall. Um, like I said, the boy looks like he's hurt and the girl looks very upset. Is there anything you want to do? this point i'll look around and see if anyone is gonna do anything like does it look like anybody's about to you know go offer help or anything like that it does look like the experienced peregrine looks like he's about to go see what's going on okay well after looking around at everyone else with a furrowed brow of um, almost a somewhat judgmental look, like, what's wrong with you people, <laughs> kind of look. Uh, I'll gather my, my travel dust, travel-worn dust cloak around me and walk swiftly towards the um, scudomorph and the people clearly in need of aid. Okay. So you and the experienced peregrine kind of move out from the safety of the wall. And... Um, you can see the young people kind of slide off of the back of this creature. And as you approach, the scudomorph seems to kind of like rear up a little bit and chitter. This is not its normal sort of environment. And the, the young man, he, he seems a little weak, but determined. And he says, please, 
uh, we're writing to get help. I have two tasks, and I, I can't do both of them. I was sent to take my sister to the Cillion Basin. She needs protection there. Um, but my family's been attacked, and I need to help them too. If someone can help me with one or the other, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Okay. So me and uh, Blood Scars have arrived at this location at the same time. Yes. Okay. The first thing I want to do while listening to this kid is assess how dangerous the scutamo- uh, scutamorph is. Sure. So I would say since scutamorphs aren't that uncommon, um, it wouldn't be too difficult to assess normally. It'd probably be difficulty two standard. But since you're not so good with the knowledge stuff, mm. it's probably difficulty three. But I am really good at determining if something's dangerous. That's true. So that would bring it back down. So let's go back down to two. Okay. So you would need a six or better. To succeed in... Because this is going to affect my demeanor is all. Sure. All right. Ten. So scutamorphs uh, usually stay to themselves... Um, huddled around whatever structure they curl up onto. Because they're primarily opportunistic feeders. Um, Things that go onto the tree or whatever they're wrapped around, they can snack on. And it's very uncommon for them to be out in an environment like this, away from their structure. Um, And so you know that when alarmed... These things can be dangerous. And it definitely seems uncomfortable right now. Okay. So I don't remember what my lullaby blanket does. <laughs> I named it lullaby blanket because I thought that was an apt descriptor for what it does. Yeah. So but your oddity exactly. yeah. is a blanket that when draped over a living creature emits a soft, pleasant humming sound. Okay. So it's just, I mean, it's literally what I wrote. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Okay. That's, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure it didn't have some other, uh, more fantastic effect. Right. All right. Uh, that's fine though. I mean, I can, uh, gosh, I feel like that blanket would still be back with my, where I was bedded down. So I probably don't have that with me anymore. Uh, so the girl is still up on the worm and the boy has slid down to the ground. So they've both slid off of the creature's back. Okay. The girl has her hand against it and the boy is kind of stepped forward to plead with you. Okay. I thought, now is he hurt? Yes. He's hurt. Yeah. Okay. And his quest is to guide her to the, uh, the Cillian Basin. Cillian Basin. And also, but do he also wants else? to go back and protect his family because they were attacked. Okay, got it. All and right. obviously, he can't do both of these things. So he's looking for either someone to take over and guiding his sister to this place of safety, or while he's doing that, to go back and check on his family. All right. Well, taking the girl to. Um, the Cillian Basin sounds just more dramatically intriguing to me. Sure. That's like the kind of, uh, I see a whole movie playing out in my head when I think <laughs> about that plot hook, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, going back to check on the family, that's cool too, I guess. But I don't know how it would play out as far as uh, just randomly saying, yeah, sure, we'll help out with, uh, you know. You can definitely ask him questions about what's going on if you'd like to do so. Hmm. So, Kane is not very uh, subtle when it comes to social stuff out on out on the road like this, especially spending time in some of the harsher environments that the wander will take you through. So he's very pragmatic, in other words. And he'll walk up to the boy and start examining his injuries um, in a very 
matter of fact sort of way and gauge uh, his reaction, you know, to this. And while he's doing that, he'll tell them, we will have to decide that later. For now, you are hurt. Yeah, this is going to take some work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so you're taking a look at him, and he doesn't seem overly defensive about his wound. He's more looking for anyone who's willing to help him at this point. The only thing he seems to be concerned about is delay. Mm, So as you're checking him over, he doesn't stop you from looking at anything. Um, It's almost like he's learned to ignore it at this point. Hmm. Um, But he says, truly, uh, we must be on our way uh, one way or the other. I I must get my sister to safety and... I don't know what will befall my family if I'm gone too long. And you notice it's um, a laceration. It's relatively deep, and it goes basically diagonally from one shoulder across his chest down towards his abdomen. That's pretty bad. So I feel like I would tell him, you won't be doing anything if we don't address this wound. I just... I don't have the time, sir. I, my family needs help in two different directions. I, we will see to that. Time is, any, is the only thing any of us really have in the end. Come, come to the camp. And um, I'll, I didn't get Bloodscar's name, so I'll just call him Bloodscar's. You, Bloodscar's, help the girl. And he looks at you, and he doesn't seem offended by you calling him that. Um, he, he sort of like gives you a half smile, and he says... Martok. Martok, well met. I'm Connie. All right. Connie, let's get these children to safety. And he goes to, like, basically take the girl's hand. Mm -hmm. And she recoils a little bit. She's startled. And when she does, she takes her hand off the scutamorph. And it... And starts, like, scurrying back northward. (laughs) Okay. Just runs... Do you want to do anything? Are you... I mean, I'm not going to tell her how to control her mount if it's not going wild and, like, you know, um, being a danger to anyone or anything. And the boy looks back at the scutamorph and he says, I didn't think we'd be able to get it all the way to town anyway, <laughs> but it was good that it got us at least this far. And he says, come on, Saria, and gestures to the girl. All right, cool. So when we're talking boy and girl here, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times in like movies and and anime or whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, it's a boy or a girl and they look like they're 23 and shit. Right. Like, so, um, you know, how boy and girl are we talking here? Um, I would say he's probably about 16, like mid teens, not really a, a man. Mm -hmm. A young man. A young man, yeah. And she's probably somewhere between six and eight. Oh, okay. She is little. Mm -hmm. All right. She's a little one, actually a kid. He is a kid, but, you know. Like, she's not a toddler or anything like that. Right. Um, But she's definitely a young girl. Mm, Okay. Cool. Well, all... Right then, let's get them to the camp and see if we can't get uh, get the boy some medical attention. Sure. All right. So while you're looking to that, and you can see, especially the mother and things like that, are, seem to be gathering supplies together, some food, um, some medical uh, materials. She actually pulls from one of her pouches what looks like a... Cipher? Is that what your hmm. one uses are called? Sorry, new system. Yes. She pulls um, what you'd recognize as a cipher, like a small spray um, that you recognize as being pretty common for physical wounds and things like that. Oh, right. Yeah. The first aid spray from yeah. Resident Evil Industries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it has a little like umbrella like logo on it. <laughs> yeah. And. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm all 100% better. My, my arm <laughs> grew back. No problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so, you know, and she's tending to him. I'm going to have you go ahead and make an intellect-based role to see if through your interaction with the boy, he warms up to you. 
Okay. Oh, oh no. <laughs> hey, this is actually a good uh, opportunity to explore some of the game mechanics because that roll a one? is a one. All right. So you're going to talk to the boy. He tells you his name is Patel. Oh. And you caught the girl's name was Saria. And he seems pretty guarded about talking about his sister, especially very protective of her. And anytime he says anything about her needing help, her needing to get to Cillian Basin, uh, someone needing to guide her there, she doesn't talk very much, but she does, when she does, it's to interrupt him and tell him he's wrong, <laughs> basically, hmm. in her little girl way. And so he's like, S- someone needs to get her to Cillian Basin. She, she needs protection there. And she says, no, Patel, no, I do not. You know, and things like that. And one of the times she does that, she like kind of puts her hand out to argue with him, basically. She's gesticulating. But when she does, she brushes your skin. Mm-hmm. And when she does, you feel and you notice the underlying tissue, if you want to call it that, there, mm. sort of um, like phosphoresce okay. in response. And in your mind, you hear her voice say something you don't understand. It's a very quiet, guttural, but also sort of lyrical sound. But you don't hear it out loud. Got it. All right. And she kind of looks at you and backs away a little bit. Yeah. And gets quiet. recoil and and pull my sleeve down as Mm -hmm. best I can to cover cover any glowing nanofilaments just below the surface of my skin. Now you're pretty practiced at hiding Mm. this thing about you. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to have you go ahead and make a speed roll. Well, it's a standard difficulty, difficulty two, so six or better, just to make sure you cover it in time for before anyone notices. Okay. 13. Yeah, everyone's really paying attention to feeding these kids and like getting them fixed up. So no one really notices your arm, especially with how quickly you're able to move your garments to cover it. Yeah. And so the boy's name was Patel. His sister is Saria. 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 Yeah. Probably spelled the same way, <laughs> but S-E-R-A-A. S E R I A. I A. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So she recoiled from me, I recoiled from her, and that's as should be. Yes. <laughs> I was I managed to pull my sleeve down and all is well with the world. Oh, but you do get one XP for my intrusion mm. into your story. But you're not really able to build much of a rapport as it was with Patel. Uh, because of this distraction that happened with his sister. So other people are kind of like huddled around him, like tending to his wounds and things, which does seem better at this point. Yeah, and it's not like high on his priority list necessarily right now. I mean, he on the one hand, he's asking for help, Mm -hmm. so making friends should be important to him. On the other hand, he does seem a little frazzled, so... Right. And distraught. Sure. You know... So I get it. It's yeah. okay. Are there any questions you want to ask him while he is being tended to? I'll hunker down next to him. I'm assuming they have him kind of reclined so that they can clean his wound and dress it and put a poultice and a balm and some first aid spray and whatnot on it. Right. Now, just so you know, <laughs> the first aid spray in Resident Evil wasn't like something that mutated you into a zombie. It was a healing item. And it's mm-hmm. just like a little can of like Neosporin spray. Right. Right. But like you get like a big chunk taken out of your shoulder by a zombie or like you get slashed by some mutant creature's claws or something like that. And your health can be all the way down to like, you know, danger and red and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And you'll use the first aid spray and it just like, like that and, Ah, your health is just all, all the way back up to 100%. <laughs> I just assume that anything potentially made by Umbrella Corp could mutate you into a zombie. Like, there's always a chance. I feel like there's a dice roll that happens behind the scenes. 
And on a one, you go blah, 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 and your head splits and like weird shit happens. I don't know. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, the Umbrella Universe is very creepy. Uh, extremely Cronenberg. I love it because of all of that stuff. I'm not trying to get off on too much of a tangent. I'm just saying the first aid spray was this miracle spray right. that like you're supposed to use for like minor cuts and, and yeah. scratches. It's like liquid bandage, yeah. but somehow it magically grows back all your flesh. And right. Stuff. <laughs> just, it heals you a hundred percent. Like, you know, I, I'm sorry to have to deliver this grave diagnosis well being but. that this spray is one billion years old it probably doesn't work that well uh, um but it does seem to help close up the wound a bit okay that's cool and mother <laughs> has lost her cipher man uh she's a good person though I'll make a mental note of that that i mean she she burned a cipher on this random stranger yeah and that's she's a mom either she has a shitload of those things or, you can't carry a shitload of those things. Bad oh, things happen. Right. You can only carry, what, two? Well, you can carry two. It depends on your affinity for the Numenera. Oh, right. Okay. So a very small, you know, limited quantity yes. can be carried. And she decided to, to burn one yeah. of these rare things. True. Okay. Well, that's cool. All right. So Kana is hunkered down next to where the boy is... Uh, being tended to and i don't know i feel like he maybe like has lost some of his overt sense of urgency like like sort of like giving in to like i'm gonna let the the moms of the group tend right. to me because there's just no escape from it I just, right. I ha you know what i mean where you're kind of like okay yeah you see a couple of the women have focused on addressing the wounds cleaning things up and a couple of the men have actually gone to get him and his sister food um, from the remnants of the, the camp food. Okay. And his sister is nearby with yeah. an earshot. She, she backed, like backed away from you, like but she moved towards Patel to okay. kind of stand with him. All right. So this whole time he's been studying him, studying her. Right. I think that he would have like continued to babble about, you know, I need to go back and check on my family, but I need to also get her to Cillian Bison. Right. <laughs> and all that, yeah. Like, however he talked, I yeah. don't remember. It was something like that. Not quite as comedy, but sure. <laughs> and, I made uh, everyone in this region a little Western because it's kind of out in the, the wild areas other people don't live in. Right. Yeah. Okay. Kane would ask Patel, you say, your, you say your family was attacked. By what? By who? And he looks at you and he says, well, the, the village was attacked by Polones. And you would know what those are. So I'm going to give you a picture in chat and I'll talk at you a little bit about what they be. So Polones are disc-like semi-transparent creatures. They're incredibly thin and they migrate in groups around the ninth world, sort of like jellyfish swimming in an ocean. Um, but they do, when they're hungry, they do attack um, creatures and humans and things like that. And the way they do that is by spinning really fast and cutting with their kind of slicey razor edge. So they'll dive at something to, to slice into them. And you know that they tend to target exposed flesh because they can work a bit better against that than armor and that sort of thing. Um, and if they kill something, a bunch of them will land and drain the creature of its blood and then all take off again and go along their merry way. Um, intelligent, razor sharp, blood sucking saran wrap. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty horrifying. <laughs> Damn, Monty, you crazy. <laughs> and he says, it's not the first time we've been attacked. It, creatures have been acting strange, and I've got to get my sister to safety, but I don't know how long my family can survive without the extra help. Okay. I mean, I'm thinking to myself that if he's their, like, you know, one of their best soldiers, that maybe they're fucked anyway. <laughs> but, uh... Not not to disparage his prowess, but sure. I mean he's a kid, yeah. you know. So, I I, I, I mean I'm maybe they sent him off because he'd already gotten hurt and they needed to get his sister out of there. It does seem yeah. like his wound is consistent with um yeah. a polone uh, slice. Sure. 
So I just I wonder how much difference he could make, but vocalizing that I don't think would be right. Uh, he definitely feels constructive. Like he is necessary. Right yeah. Exactly. Like you don't want to, you know, be a dick about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And your family? How far away are they? The village is in the false woods. We have a clearing there that, you know, and people have been able to make up a, a town of sorts in the area. Oh, shit. They're not travelers. They're, he's from village. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hmm. So how far away is that? So you know that it's not too far north of the part of the wander that you're on right now. Um, you could probably get to the woods in, you know, a couple hours or so of travel. Um, and then depending on where it is in the woods, you would, it'd probably take you another hour to traverse oh. the actual wood itself to get to the village. Well, all right. Yeah, it's like really close mm -hmm. then. And so this combat is probably pretty fresh. If he's bleeding, running from the wood to find help. Okay. Yeah. No wonder he's such in such a hurry. That makes more sense. Mm -hmm. All right. And I wonder, like, is does the trail that we're we're on a stop along the trail? Yeah, basically. And if we keep going the way we've been going, does that go towards the Cillian Basin? Well, let's see. Are you traveling west or east? I don't know. <laughs> All right. So west would kind of take you towards the nearer coast, kind of towards more civilization. Mm -hmm. East kind of takes you more into the, the out there, the places beyond. Okay. I feel like I've come from the places beyond. Okay. Because a bunch of shit happened to me in sure. the, the Badlands type area of uh, the Wandering Walk Trail. Okay. So I would be traveling from the Badlands toward the direction away from the balance, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. So I'd be going west then? Yeah, so you're okay. heading west. So you, your natural path, if you continued on it, is taking you towards Cillian Basin. Okay. You know Cillian Basin is a town um, nestled in the foothills of that the mountain range to the west um, that is known for its like hot springs and natural pools. All right. And so a lot of travelers stop there in their journeys. I see. So for some reason, this guy wants to get his sister there mm -hmm. pretty imperatively. Yep. Okay. I'm going that way. Others might be going that way. Yep. All right. Been mulling all this over. I'll, I'll nod at the kid with a, a very Obama-like not bad face. <laughs> <laughs> and stand up to address the camp at large. Who among us is going west? And you note that most of the travelers seem to be heading away from civilization as part of their pilgrimage. Um, and so of the dozen or so people that are there with you, they all sort of look around at each other. And some seem sort of reluctantly willing to change direction, but most of them are on this path for reasons. Okay. So I met everyone last night as they're on their way out. Mm hmm I'm on my way in. Yeah. Okay. And that's why I didn't recognize anyone from the from, old from dusty travel. trail. Yeah. All right. Cool. So no one's going west. Okay. I seem to be the only one headed in that direction, Patel. Uh, I don't think that there is any help for it. I would go back with you to check on your village and then catch up with your sister if she could travel with someone else. But it seems as though there is no one else for her to travel with. I'm saying this in kind right. of a loud voice in case anyone picks up on it. Like, well, yeah. I'll take the girl. Yeah. As long and as he Syria doesn't seem like a scumbag. says, you know, <laughs> like, I don't need anyone to take me. I can go myself. Of course you can, little one. And Mother, who you also haven't learned the name of at this point. <laughs> um, she kind of turns and says, well, Cillian's not far. If you needed us to change direction, we could at least get her there. And then continue on our way. And then the old peregrine says, or if you want to take the girl, I can at least get the boy back to the woods. I think that 
he might need some help when they get back to their village. But the type of help that they need depends on the situation when you get there. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I don't have any medical training or anything like that. So if, uh, you know, if that's the type of help that he needs when we come upon his village and it's just wrecked, I'm just going to be kind of useless. Whereas if we get back and they're still being attacked by these things, then I can help. But it seems like these things are kind of like a, a blitz sort of attack rather than like a sustained ongoing thing. So it seems like sending someone to help him who can assist in a medical regard makes more sense. Okay. So you want to take, you want to try to convince someone to go and help in a certain way, try to convince a group of them to go that are ready for different situations. Right. Just appeal to anyone, you know, based on what we've heard, you know? Yeah. So that would definitely be intellect based Mm -hmm. because that's kind of your charisma and you're definitely asking them to do something against what they're here to do. Uh, So let's call it difficulty three. Okay. Um, now how how do we do effort with this if if like so normally so as a tier one character mm-hmm. you can spend one level of effort on any task okay a level of effort by default costs three points from that pool unless you have edge which discounts the cost right and i know for intellect you do not have edge i do not so it would cost you three of your intellect points so i have one effort is my score. That's not like one effort point that I can spend. So one effort is the maximum you can spend on a given task. Got it. So if my effort pool or if my effort score were two. You could lower it by two difficulties by spending the points. I could spend two X points from a pool. Yes. But since my effort score is one as a tier one, yeah. I can do one X points from a pool. Exactly. Got it. Okay. So you can spend effort to lower the difficulty by one and your training skills or items are also all potentially able to additionally lower from there. But you're definitely acting outside of your skill set. Yeah, no, there's, there's really nothing in my skills that would give me an edge on this. I'm just going to try really hard to convince everyone. Yeah. So I have spent three intellect points. Okay. Lower the difficulty to three. Okay. If I remember correctly. Yes. All right. Cool. All right. 14. Okay. So you, well, go ahead. What do you tell the group? Everyone. This is Patel. He needs help with his family. They've recently been attacked by Polones, and it would seem as though that the attack maybe is over and run its course. Any reinforcements in a combat sense would not be very helpful, but if anyone could render aid to his family, I would be happy to see his sister along the road to Cillian Basin. All right, and so the peregrines all sort of look to each other, and the the old peregrine and the mother and her son sort of like give each other the nod. And the old peregrine says, I'm not on this path to avoid what it offers. I can certainly go back and see what aid I can provide. And the mother says, yes, uh, my boy and I are on this path as well to, to prove what, what we can be in this age. And it, it seems ill-advised for us to to ignore people in need. And she kind of checks her pack and she says, I don't have much more uh, in the, the way I helped the boy, but I'm sure we could find some things and, and do what we could to help. I, I mean, I could at least see the extent of their injuries if, if there were uh, better than most. And she kind of makes the circle of augmentation symbol with her hands again. The like her son did. Of augmentation. So you would know that this is a hand gesture 
that is commonly used in the ninth world to designate that what you're talking about is related to technological augment. Hmm. And sometimes it can be used just in a matter of fact way, like saying, I can see it better, make the symbol. We put your fists together and you twist them in opposite directions. Kind of like you're uh, getting some fresh ground pepper yeah. on your salad. Okay. Um, and that could mean like, that's why I would be more successful just in a matter of fact way. Hmm. Some people use it um, sort of as a, like a derogatory way though. If they suspect mm -hmm. someone is like nanotech augmented and they don't like that, they might like make that symbol at them almost like a nephew sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, but she seems to be doing it just in the, a matter of fact, like, like I can see better what their injuries might be so we could help. But, um, but yeah. So they agree to go with Patel, not only to the edge of the wood, but to take him back home and see what help they can offer. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. I guess we have I guess we have a plan. They're going to go back with him and I'm going to carry on with the girl to get her to Silly and Basin. Yep. And the paths that you're both both groups are taking are kind of equidistant from where you are in the cairn. But your path is a bit easier because you're on the path the whole time. So your trek will actually be pretty quick to get her to Cillian Basin. They're not far from it at this point. Um, and Cillian is directly on the road. So um, you may even be able to get her there and circle back if you needed to or whatever you wanted to do. So I'll need to get some more information yes. from Patel sure. about where to take her, why I'm taking her there, <laughs> what the heck is going on. Yeah. Why is it so important to get her there? Yeah. And who am I giving her to when I arrive? I'm not just going to take her there and settle down and open a daycare. I mean. Sure. <laughs> um, go ahead and make a intellect roll. The difficulty is five. All right. So 15 or better. Yeah. Nice and difficult. That doesn't count, even though it was a nat 20. <laughs> slipped out of my hand. Does not count. So honest. 13. Okay. Not, not quite, quite there. there. He seems very reluctant to talk about Syria too much. Very protective of her. Um, and he says, the, the, help, the help that she needs is in Cillian. She's... She's unwell, and it's too dangerous out here. She needs someone who can help her. Do you know anyone in town? Do you, do you have someone in mind? And he says, there's a woman uh, that we know. She runs a shop there. I, I don't know the letters, but the sign looks like this. And in the sand, the teal sand of this area... He draws a shape that's sort of a, you know, a lumpy hemispherical shape, you know, brain shape, if you will. Okay. Like if you were going to draw a cartoon brain, that's what he draws in the sand. All right. And he says, she, she'll know what to do. And you just need to get her there. All right. I can work with this. But what is her name? Uh, her name's Darwin. How far away are we? From Cillian Basin, time-wise. Yeah, like I said, it's very similar to you getting to the False Woods. Okay. So it's um, a couple of hours, maybe two and a half hours from where you are now on foot. Okay. I will see your sisters to this shop. And I will wait for you there for three days. Thank you. And he kind of is getting his stuff together and talking with those who are willing to go back with him to his village. All right. So are you getting your stuff together and leaving today since it's not too far of a walk? Yeah. And it's the morning. Yeah. You know, so the day is just starting. Yeah. So, it means yeah. a little bit later in the morning because of all this excitement, mm -hmm. um, but it's still early enough in the day. And as everyone sort of parts and goes their various ways, you begin your journey with Saria and she doesn't speak much at all. 
as you head towards Cillian Betis and you notice that she doesn't seem well. Um, she does complain a bit about headaches or things being loud. But she keeps up with you with surprising ease. She doesn't seem to have any physical ailments. Okay. But she stays really quiet and strained um, the whole time. Are you going to talk to her at all, or do you kind of stay quiet on the on the journey? Gosh, I think I should probably respond to her complaints, you mm-hmm. know? Um, not necessarily trying to be comforting, but in... Um, you know, engaging kind of way. Use that as a segue to see if I can gather more information about her situation because I was unsuccessful with Patel. Okay. So when she complains of a headache, you know, um, sympathize and then follow that up with a question. Yes, headaches can be quite troublesome, child. When, uh, when did they start to afflict you? So... Being careful about the way you talk to her so it's not super like pressing with a ton of questions does make it easier for her to respond to you. Um, so she is, this is going to be difficulty two. So target number six or better. Here on we go. Her intellect. Ooh, 20. Oh, okay. So natural 20. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, because you don't add anything. Right. After. Um, <laughs> no. I didn't mean it like that. I was just like, yeah. yeah naturally (laughs) so you do really well she seems to open up to you although you notice it seems not that she's unwilling to talk but she's having difficulty talking and she kind of holds her head and she says they've been happening for a while i hear a strange sound it makes my head hurt it's hard to think sometimes I'm really worried about my family. Hmm. They will be in good hands soon. Of this, I am certain. All right. And so as you're talking to her, you're a bit distracted, but not overly so. Um, I will say I'm going to give you an opportunita. Um, Understanding that you're trained in assessing danger. I am going to say that... This is, instead of being difficult, it's simply demanding. So I need you to roll nine or better on your intellect. Okay. Let's give it a try. Seven. Aw. Bum, 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 So you are talking to the girl as you walk, and that has led you not to pay quite as much attention to your surroundings on the road. hmm And so you are caught a little bit off guard when three of the peregrines from earlier in the day that you were camped with mm-hmm. seem to have followed you. Ah. And as you turn kind of maybe to greet them or something like that, because they're familiar to you, mm-hmm. um, one of them says, hand over the girl. Oh, wow. Okay. So they just cut straight to the chase. They're not even... Uh making an attempt at subterfuge or anything like that. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, I am going to actually ignore them completely and turn my attention to uh, Saria. Okay. And kneel down to get on her level and uh, ask her, do you have any games that you played back home, child? In your mind to pass the idle hours. Sometimes we look at the clouds and we talk about what they look like and and we think about what they would look like if there was a light swarm, too. I'm going to talk to these men now. Can you find me some interesting shapes in the clouds and tell me about them when I get back? And she kind of looks back at them, a little nervous. She says, okay. Look away now, child. Pay no mind to our conversation. I'll be back soon. And she kind of like squats down and looks up with her back to you. All right, cool. All right, so then I'll have to get up and turn around and walk back towards the men at at a normal pace. Nothing, uh, nothing too threatening. Sure. Right now, my goal is to close the distance, so I want to see how close they'll let me get. Just walking straight towards whoever's in the front appears to be the leader. Yeah. And uh, 
And as you walk forward, the one kind of towards the front who spoke to you steps forward and like straightens himself up. He says, we don't want any trouble with you. Just hand her over. Okay. Yeah, I'm still not talking to these dudes. <laughs> you know, I'm just looking right at the guy, striding straight at him while he makes his uh, his speeches and demands. Sure. That, that are falling on, on my deaf ears. Sure. I don't know if it matters right now. My intent is to walk right up to him and hit him so hard that his dead Aunt Sally dies. <laughs> 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 well, let's go ahead and have you roll a speed check. And it's going to be six or better, is what you want, to see if you get to act before he does. Okay, cool. Here we go. Ooh, oh, six. Okay. Just barely squeaked by. So he seems to notice, like, right as you get close to him, that maybe your intent is violence. Mm -hmm. But before he actually gets to fully respond, like, you notice him notice, right? right. Like, where he's like, oh, sure. <laughs> but you're already <laughs> moving. So what do you do? Okay. So without breaking stride, just walk up to him. You know, he, he's maybe, like, at first, you know, he was like, hand over the girl. And I turn around and talk to her, stuff like that. Right. I stand back up, start striding towards him with a purpose. And he's saying, we don't want any trouble now. Just hand her over. And then I just keep on walking. And he's like, now look, if you want to do this the hard way is what he's going to say. But maybe he gets as far as, now look, if you want to do this the hard like that. Mm -hmm. And as I take that final step to get within range, plant that foot, twist from the hips, it just with this like vicious hook to the jaw, uh, just slobber knock punch him so his lips go sideways and uh, interrupt his sentence. Okay. So this is going to be uh, demanding difficulty three. So that means nine or better mm -hmm. unaugmented. Okay. okay. Cool. All right. And is this a uh, speed or might? I'm just curious. So you are using your fists as a weapon. Right. So this will actually, because they're light weapons, your fists, mm -hmm. very light, right. lightest of weapons. True, but. <laughs> uh, that would bring down the difficulty by one. Okay. So you'd need six or better. Cool. All right. And I still hit like a truck, even with the. Uh, without any kind of weapon right. because due to my cybernetic augmentations, I have no need for weapons. So my unarmed strikes count as a medium weapon. Yeah. So I have like a bat or similar. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this guy's probably in for a little bit of a surprise because as the, the punch winds up, you can hear sort of that, um, Almost that that slight servo whine mm, of uh, mm -hmm. mechanical augmentation, but this is very highly technical. It's almost like when when Iron Man makes a move that like, like a, okay. a, a slight glow because he's not really perturbed right now. But there's not definitely, trying too hard yet, right? Yeah. A little a little glowiness, something preternatural about sure. this dude. All right, that's a twelve. Okay, so success. Mm -hmm. All right, and so you strike the peregrine in the lead for four damage. Yes. All right. Kind of as you intend, like, his face goes sideways and spittle and blood fly out of his mouth. And he kind of stumbles a bit um, and looks back at his fellows. He seemed to, like, take a step back from you. And he says, you don't know what you're dealing with with her. It's better that she's out of your hands. Huh. Oh, wow. I just walked up and socked this dude without even talking about it. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you know what you're doing, man. <laughs> yeah. And he pulls a blade, um, right. you know, out from its sheath on his hip. That is okay. His fellows do as well. Okay. And he says, one last chance. Give her up. While they're wasting their time talking, sure. I mean, we're already, uh, you know engaged in uh in combat so uh i i think that the the time for negotiations is past i've already decided on my course of action but i'm not going to declare it to these guys at all sure you know i'm just going to keep attacking until i win because i'm not going to talk my way out of this okay so i've kind of decided on that path 
as a foregone conclusion. Okay. So, um, and by I, I mean Kane has decided. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, in response, I'm just going to uh, attack the leader's uh, arm that's holding the knife. That uh, That is definitely the biggest threat. So, I need to get inside his range and uh, grapple that arm in to, to disarm him. So Okay. Is that speed or might? Since I'm going for like a... I'm already really close to him. You mm-hmm. know, I'm within a hand-to-hand distance. I think since I'm grabbing his arm and, you know, going for like a a joint lock type of thing to uh, to disable it, that it's probably might. Okay. In, in terms of game mechanics rules, sure. I think it would be might. All right. So. So let's go ahead and make a might roll and it's still six or better. Okay. Cool. And you can't decide to modify your difficulty after the fact. Is that true? Not after you roll, because right. you know what you're rolling against. You would say that at the start. Gotcha. You can't be like, ooh, I failed. Let me lower it to, no. to make it have worked. Yeah. Okay. So you've got to decide if you're going to gamble that. All right. Cool. So it's a difficulty two right now? Yes. I'll take those odds. Okay. They're in your favor. 14. Okay, yeah. So you grab his arm, right? Because your intent is to rest his weapon. Right, like where you kind of grab it with with one hand and then snake the other one around, grab your own wrist, and then just like pop it back so that it kind of, you know, hyperextends the, the joint a little bit, maybe, you know not quite completely dislocates it or breaks anything or whatever, but just sort of sprains it and causes you to let go of the knife. So you can't disarm him because that is an effect. Okay. So you need to roll well for that. Right, right. Um, But you can certainly go in and like basically hurt his arm so he doesn't get to defend with it this round or whatever. Sure. Um, And so you do more damage to him and he kind of like cries an alarm and he's like, don't you know what she is? Didn't you see her with that creature? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> He's just still trying to talk me out of it. These yep. guys are probably good guys, and I've just already decided that I'm going to like beat them up. All right. uh, I'm not a good person. So one of the other ones <laughs> moves in with a blade to uh, try to get you off of his friend. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so I need you to roll your speed defense, right? Because is that what you're using, or are you using might defense? Oh, no. I, I'm a very dodgy. Yeah. Um, so you're going to be rolling your speed defense. You do have plus one armor. Mm-hmm. So you need to roll three or better. Okay. Here we go. Whoop. Fell off the table. 14 again. Okay. All right. And so you quickly kind of move behind his friend, basically, to move out of the range of his attack. And he kind of avoids, you know, hitting his ally. And so he pulls his attack a bit. And then the other one's going to attack you. So go ahead and make your roll again to defend against the other attack. Okay. Here we go. 17. Okay. So 17, since you aren't attacking this round, nothing crazy happens. But yeah, you're easily able to just keep basically moving this guy in front of you. Yeah. Like while you're holding his arm. Right. I have him by the arm. And so his knife is like kind of, you know, a non threat right now and right. I, yeah I'm, I'm positioning to to use him as a human shield yeah and every time you like pull basically like his wrist or whatever to move him into a defensive position for you he like cries out an alarm yeah that can't feel good and something dawned on me sure. just now as the player and so i didn't really understand Kane's motivations until just now but so I was have I was like kind of second guessing him right like these guys are trying to reasonably talk to me about the situation and I'm just like resorting straight to violence here's the thing kids if these dudes intentions were on the up and up they would have brought up their concerns in camp and would not have waylaid us when we were alone on the trail yeah so to to Kane it stands to reason that they are up to no good. Well, people with good intentions don't usually demand you give someone to them. <laughs> right. They, they don't They don't demand that you, you know, hand her over or, or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. So 
I was feeling bad for a minute there, but I'm 100% over that. Okay. Well, it is your turn. What would you like to do? Okay. Cool. I need to put the leader down, you know, mm. uh, more for good. Uh, so, because if I can disable him completely, then it, it puts me in a better spot to negotiate with the other two. It really takes the wind out of their sails, you know, when, when there's a, a your next kind of feeling. Sure. So, uh, I would like to see if I can do a sort of throw now with the, the arm that I have tangled up. Okay. Do a kind of uh, judo move and throw this dude onto his face and hopefully take the fight out of him. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. What kind of difficulty are we looking at for this? Are we still at uh, two or better for me? Yes, yeah, so six or like, better. Okay, okay, cool. Fifteen. So, yeah. You are... Go ahead and describe what you do. All right. So as he's uh, resisting me, you know, I'll all of a sudden take a step and go with the way he's resisting me and throw him over my hip with, you know, aiming his head at the ground. And that sounds a little more brutal maybe than it is, but honestly, I, I have to make some pretty harsh decisions in yeah. this encounter right now. So, um... Uh, the time for mercy maybe has passed. Right, yeah. So there is like this dusty bluish cloud as he, he goes head first into the, the gritty sand of this area and like falls limp onto the ground. Um, and you see his cohort sort of back up. One of them drops his blade that he was using. Look, he told us she was a beal. <laughs> Do I know what that is? Well, you're not the best with knowing stuff. <laughs> That's true. Um, but I would say it's not a very uncommon term. So it would normally be a two. Let's call it a three. So nine or better. Here we go. Ooh, 20. Okay. You've definitely heard this term before. You may have even met a beal before. Uh, a beal is a genetic ability, something people are often born with, although it doesn't always manifest right away, mm -hmm. that gives them um, sort of mental connections to creatures and people. And beals are also known to be able to commune very well with each other. And so if there are many of them in the same area, that is something that concerns non beals Okay. Um, because it seems like their links intensify hmm. when they're near each other. He's basically uh, a mutant with empathic powers. Yeah. Big deal. I mean, they want to, yeah. like, take her off and, I don't know, kill her for that. Yeah. They're like, she's dangerous. But Fuck that. If she is so dangerous, then I guess you should be on your way. Um, go ahead and let's go ahead and make a roll for you to intimidate them. So that's going to be intellect six or better. All right, here we go. 17. Yeah. And they're like, it's your funeral. And they start moving back east cool. down the trail. I'll tell them, uh, as, as they begin to retreat, I'll call after them and be sure to take your friend with you and spit on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and so somewhat ruined by the chuckle immediately as after. you move back <laughs> towards Saria they move forward they're not trying to get closer to you um, and like check on you know the peregrine who is leading them and you can see one of them kind of shake his head and the other one like puts a hand on him and says you know may your bones serve the cairns Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> and they kind of go through and gather some of his things. Kind of going for the Hollywood knockout and end up with... Uh, <laughs> the realistic what happens when you drop someone on their The head. real life <laughs> <laughs> consequences of uh, throwing someone over your hip onto their head. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, back at Saria, we're uh, ready to go. Mm -hmm. And she looks up at you. I don't know if your view has changed of her at all with uh, what you've learned. Um, but she 
points at a cloud nearby. And she's like, look, it's a scooty morph on a tree. I see. I would have said that it was a rope around the mast of a great ship. Look there, you can see the masthead. Have you seen a ship? Ah, yes, child. I've seen many a ship in my day. And she actually starts talking to you a bit as you continue down the path. And that is where we will end it for today on your approach to Cillian Basin. Done! Cool. You're done! All right. <laughs> I just like to tell everyone that I'm going to work on Kane's accent because <laughs> I was a little inconsistent. So sorry about that. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm going to work on it. It'll be much better next time, I promise. All right. So uh, when we pick up next time, uh, we'll pick up with your entrance into Cillian Basin mm-hmm. and looking for um, Darvin, the shopkeep. Right. In that town. And see how you do there. Darvin, the female owner of the brain icon shop. Yes, (laughs) that is true. The brain emoji shop. The brain emoji shop. (laughs) Sell only the finest emojis. (laughs) Only poops and brains. We've got wrinkly brains. We've got smooth brains. (laughs) We have little nodule knobby node brains. All right, so uh, that was our first little foray into Numenera. We went a little bit longer, but because I wanted to make sure we got a tiny bit of combat in there along with a lot of really setup for the adventure. Yeah. Um, if you are a patron, right after this, we record our little behind the scenes, our thoughts, uh, our expectations for what's coming next and things like that. And so you'll see that in your secret feed, which you can get access to on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash just barbarian things. Sounds good. Yes. All right. So I've been rainy. You can find me on Twitter at barbarian rainy, um, or check the description for other ways to locate me on the internets. That sounds good. I'm Santiago. You can hit me up on Twitter at Rangugiri and give me pointers, tips, and tricks about improving your accent work. (laughs) Or if you want to check me out doing completely unrelated video game stuff on YouTube, I'm on uh, youtube.com slash Rangu. All right. And until next time, everyone, spend your rage wisely. Yeah, don't just rush in with violence. Try talking first.